Hi everybody, I hope you're well. Today we'll read from a book titled Jeffrey Bauer, Drawing from the Archives, edited by Shayari De Silva and published by the Jeffrey Bauer Trust in collaboration with Lars Müller. In my personal research, I have been aware of the past, many periods of the past. Medieval Italian towns with their splendid instinctive massing of buildings which although varied in purpose and age make a magnificent total picture. Great English country houses and their essential complement of park and garden. Greek, Roman, Mexican and Buddhist ruins, the Alhambra in Granada, the chapel in Ronchamp, the Mogul forts in Rajasthan and the marvelous palace of Padmana Bapuram. There are also many instances when my eye was caught by a landscape, a small, unimportant but beautiful building, or a large and splendid one, sometimes seen for a moment from a swiftly moving car or train, for a day or two, or something lived amongst, like the buildings in Cambridge and Rome. The beauty of some of these buildings, gardens and landscapes leaves a considerable residue of subconscious understanding in the mind, a help to solve some present need, for the right placement of a building on a site, for the need to frame and emphasize a view or to open and construct a space, a wish to get a definite degree of light or shadow in a room. Good building in Sri Lanka has always taken this into account from the temples, monastery and places of Anuradhapura, Polonnaruwa, Sigiriya and its water garden and the other buildings that follow through the ages to the present day. I like to regard all the past and present good architecture in Sri Lanka as just that, good Sri Lankan architecture, for this is what it is not narrowly classified as Indian, Portuguese or Dutch, early Sinhalese or Kandian, or British colonial. For all the good examples of these periods have taken the country itself into first account. When you look at the better examples of what remains of these earlier buildings, you find they all have met the essentials of life in Sri Lanka, but although the past gives lessons, it does not give the whole answer to what must be done now. It is true that many of the materials available to us are the same as in the past, and their use, if sensible and right, very alike, except where new techniques have added to or changed their qualities. With these and other new materials, we must now design for a society living in a framework of a different economy, a much faster life, sometimes a freer one, new conventions and a greater liberty of belief to all the dictates of ever-changing needs. But there is, against the background of life, the great constant of the climate. One unchanging element of all buildings is the roof protective, emphatic and all-important, governing the aesthetic whatever the period, whatever the place. Often a building is only a roof, columns and floors, the roof dominant, sheltering, giving the contentment of shelter, ubiquitous, pervasive present, the scale or pattern shaped by the building beneath. The roof, its shape, texture and proportion is the strongest visual factor. At random I take an isolated item, the Sinhala tile. The Arab traders introduced to Sri Lanka many centuries ago the half-round clay roofing tile of the Mediterranean world, but the roofs built in Sri Lanka with them were more steeply pitched to shed the huge rainfall of our country. The Portuguese and the Dutch used the same tile and roof pitch, but the latter raised roofs higher for coolness, with wide eaves and verandas to shade the walls. In the hill country, the Candians used a flat clay tile like shingle on the double pitch roofs, in meeting halls which had only columns, no walls, an answer to a way of life a great roof to give shade and shelter, open to the drift of air and the encompassing view. 
More than functional buildings, it is first rational building, for it is rational to give presence to both function and form, to admit beauty and pleasure as well as purpose. There are many basic thoughts, but there are many more. Thoughts on details, the proportions of rooms, doors and windows, the heights, the sweeps and pitches of roofs. Where one looks from a room at what and through what and what is to be seen, how open and closed a view from a room should be. In these considerations, no rules can guide, or if they could, would not always give exactly the right answer. It is in this realm of part emotion, part thought, that the rest of the way must run, and it is at this stage that the architecture steps from the relative security of known and learned things into the world of intuition, inspiration, talent, gift. Call it what you will, a world inside his head and far outside it at the same time, almost sub or super conscious. This may seem extravagant when written down, but it is the unknown factor. I suppose it is here that each one of us has a separate and personal impulse, the point at which, although surrounded by the fact and reality of a project, one is alone and must make a decision to do this and not that, to do what seems at the moment inevitable. The buildings show in the following pages illustrate, as far as drawings and photographs can, the architectural answer I have found to a variety of needs. For myself, a building can only be understood by moving around and through it, and by experiencing the modulation and feel of the spaces one moves through, from the outside into verandas, then rooms, passages, courtyards, the view from these spaces into others, views through the landscape beyond and from outside the building, views back through rooms into inner rooms and courts. Equally important, the play of light in both garden and inner room, from a shaded inner space to the celebration of light in a courtyard. To achieve the possibility of enjoyment and pleasure is so necessary in addition to comfort and functional use. When one delights as much as I do in planning a building and having it built, I find it impossible to describe the exact steps in an analytical and dogmatic way. Every project is different, and each approach, each individual design based on the differing backgrounds of sight and purpose, requires a separate and total involvement, and a care that must extend from the foundations of the structures to the smallest detail of the ultimate furnishing of rooms. I have touched on a variety of points that have occurred to me which might be useful in helping to understand my buildings, but I have a very strong conviction that it is impossible to explain architecture in words. I have always enjoyed seeing buildings, but seldom enjoyed reading explanations about them, as I feel with others that architecture cannot be totally explained, but must be experienced. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.